And of course, it's not just what we say to kids, it's what we show them. The images sent back by NASA's Hubble play such a huge part in capturing kids' attention in an ever-increasingly crowded world with many, many demands on them. This means we can show kids something of the cosmic environment that surrounds them, from Saturn's rings to getting them to think about what would it be like to see a sunset on Mars. Now, manned spaceflight is a topic which kids never tire of. And because of NASA, they can read about it, they can hear about it, watch documentaries, look at photographs, and visit space centers. NASA runs a huge number of educational programs, both in and outside schools. This means that kids' space dreams aren't limited to science fiction. And with exciting new missions planned, back to the moon and onwards to Mars, it means that there may be kids now who will grow up wanting to be astronauts, as excited about it as a whole generation of astronauts today are, the ones who watched the Apollo moon landings in their pajamas with their parents and decided they were going to grow up to be an astronaut. And that's certainly an awful lot more aspirational than wanting to grow up to appear on reality TV show or become a pop star. Because of NASA, we can also show kids what our planet, what the Earth looks like from space. They can see what a beautiful planet we live on, but how vulnerable it is, how fragile it is, and we can really make it clear to them that they need to look after it. When we look around us in space, we see all sorts of other fascinating, extraordinary, exciting worlds, but we don't see another planet nearby exactly like the Earth. And that's a very strong message to kids, to say, you live on a beautiful planet, please look after it. So we're not saying that all children need to grow up and go into space, but we are saying that the work done by NASA has a profound and lasting impact on the way that children view their life on Earth, their cosmic environment. It can influence the choices they make in the future and their careers. I'd like to close with a fan letter we had from Ben, age six. His mother had told us he wasn't a confident child, but that he loved reading about space so much that it has changed his life. He wrote to us to say, now that I know I'm good at space, I've decided to become a scientist when I grow up. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I'll hand you back. What will we find when we go into space? Is there alien life out there, or are we alone in the universe? We believe that life arose spontaneously on the Earth, so it must be possible for life to appear on other suitable planets, of which there seem to be a large number in the galaxy. But we don't know how life first appeared. The probability of something as complicated as a DNA molecule being formed by random collisions of atoms in a primeval ocean is incredibly small. However, there might have been some simpler macromolecule which then built up the DNA or some other macromolecule capable of reproducing itself. Still, even if the probability of life appearing on a suitable planet is very small, since the universe is infinite, life would have appeared somewhere. If the probability is very low, the distance between two independent occurrences of life would be very large. However, there is a possibility known as panspermia, that life could spread from planet to planet, or from stellar system to stellar system carried on meteors. We know that Earth has been hit by meteors that came from Mars, and others may have come from further afield. We have no evidence that any meteors carried life, but it remains a possibility. An important feature of life spread by panspermia is that it would have the same basis, which would be DNA, for life in the neighborhood of the Earth. On the other hand, 
An independent occurrence of life would be extremely unlikely to be DNA-based. So watch out if you meet an alien. You could be infected with a disease against which you have no resistance. One piece of observational evidence on the probability of life appearing is that we have fossils of algae from 3.5 billion years ago. The Earth was formed 4.6 billion years ago and was probably too hot for about the first half billion years. So life appeared on Earth within half a billion years of it being possible, which is short compared to the 10 billion year lifetime of an Earth-like planet. This would suggest either panspermia, or that the probability of life appearing independently is reasonably high. If it was very low, one would have expected it to take most of the 10 billion years available. If it is panspermia, any life in the solar system, or in nearby stellar systems, will also be DNA-based. While there may be primitive life in our region of the galaxy, there don't seem to be any advanced intelligent beings. We don't appear to have been visited by aliens. I am discounting reports of UFOs. Why would they appear only to cranks and weirdos? <laughs> if there is a government conspiracy to suppress the reports, and keep for itself the scientific knowledge the aliens bring, it seems to have been a singularly ineffective policy so far. Furthermore, despite an extensive search by the SETI project, we haven't heard any alien television quiz shows. This probably indicates that there are no alien civilizations at our stage of development within a radius of a few hundred light years. Issuing an insurance policy against abduction by aliens seems a pretty safe bet. Why haven't we heard from anyone out there? One view is expressed in this Calvin cartoon. The caption reads, Sometimes, I think that the surest sign that intelligent life exists elsewhere in the universe is that none of it has tried to contact us. More seriously, there could be three possible explanations of why we haven't heard from aliens. First, it may be that the probability of primitive life appearing on a suitable planet is very low. Second, the probability of primitive life appearing may be reasonably high, but the probability of that life developing intelligence like ours may be very low. Just because evolution led to intelligence in our case, we shouldn't assume that intelligence is an inevitable consequence of Darwinian natural selection. It is not clear that intelligence confers a long-term survival advantage. Bacteria and insects will survive quite happily, even if our so-called intelligence leads us to destroy ourselves. This is the third possibility. Life appears, and in some cases, develops into intelligent beings. But when it reaches the stage of sending radio signals, it will also have the technology to make nuclear bombs and other weapons of mass destruction. It would therefore be in danger of destroying itself before long. Let's hope this is not a reason we have not heard from anyone. Personally, I favor the second possibility that primitive life is relatively common, but that intelligent life is very rare. Some would say it has yet to occur on Earth. <laughs> Can we exist for a long time away from the Earth? Our experience with the ISS, the International Space Station, shows that it is possible for human beings to survive for many months away from planet Earth. <laughs>